Uh, hi folks, uh, happy to be here at Now You're Cooking. Uh, it's one of my favorite places to talk about all different kinds of bread making, whether it be sourdough breads or as in the case tonight, a type of bread we don't really talk about very much or not a bread that people make a lot at home, but it's very, very simple to do and that's steamed bread. And we're gonna do two breads tonight. We're gonna do a very traditional main uh, brown bread and that is made with uh, locally, I'll be making that with locally grown rye, cornmeal, and whole wheat flour. And then we're going to do a uh, pumpkin bread that is gluten-free. It has corn flour in it, uh, cornmeal, and buckwheat flour. So this type of bread, steamed bread, uh, traditionally we think of brown bread, it's sweetened with molasses, it's very, it can be quite sweet. Um, but this format really lends itself to exploring the use of different grains. Um, and you, the breads don't necessarily have to be uh, sweet the way a brown bread is. You can also make them a, a, in a savory style as well. We won't be doing that tonight, but that's th th lots of different ways you can riff off of, of this type of bread. And it is so easy to make. We're not talking fermentation here. They're leavened with baking uh, so soda. So we're just using a chemical reaction to leaven the bread and uh, just very, very simple. So I'm gonna, I've got some breads that are steaming at the moment. We're going to pull those out in probably about 45 minutes or so. And while we're waiting for those to come out of the pot, we are going to just mix up these breads. So the first bread I'm gonna do is the main brown bread. And <clears throat> the, the traditional brown bread recipe, whether you're talking Maine brown bread, Boston brown bread, New England brown bread, is sort of the holy trinity of grains that were grown in colonial New England, uh, which are rye, corn, which the settlers learned how to grow corn from the Native Americans, and whole wheat. So uh, the first ingredient is whole wheat. It's 100 grams. Uh, I like to measure my recipes and by weight, it's, it's much more accurate um, and it's easy to scale a recipe up or down if you're doing it in grams. So we're gonna go ahead and throw in 100 grams of whole wheat flour. And if you go a gram or two off on this, you know, I'm using a digital scale just remember there are 28 grams to an ounce. So if you're a couple grams off, don't feel like you have to hit these numbers exactly. It really doesn't make a difference. So we've got our 100 grams of whole wheat flour in there. Then we're gonna switch over to the rye. You'll notice the rye has a little bit of a grayish cast to it. So it's a little different color than the, than the whole wheat flour. Both of these flours are whole grain flours, meaning the millers in this case, Aurora Mills in Arista County, who I've been working with for uh, 22, 23 years, who've been growing local grains for us, are, <clears throat> they're milling the whole rye berry or the whole wheat berry and everything, the bran, the germ, the starch, everything is in this flour. Um, so we're gonna be, I'm gonna zero out my scale and we're putting in 85 grams of rye flour. And then last but hardly least, because it's my uh, favorite of these three grains, is Abenaki Flint cornmeal that is uh, grown on at Songbird Farm in Unity, Maine. And you'll notice that the, you'll see the red uh, flakes in there. This uh, corn, most of the corn cobs are bright yellow kernels, but a significant portion are a deep magenta red and uh, so it gives it a very beautiful look to it. And actually, um, so this is, uh, you can do a close up there. Uh, their packaging is very simple. Um, and this is a flint corn, this is Abenaki flint corn. So it is a 
cornmeal that was grown by Native Americans. It uh, works well in this climate because it, we have a short growing season here in Maine and a lot of corns just don't ripen up. This one does and it, it's called flint corn because it's very, very hard shell on it and um, uh, incredible flavor. So we are going to put in um, 90, 90 grams of that. Okay, and then we're, uh, uh, you can, sometimes measuring salt and the baking soda, uh, you can either do teaspoon uh, uh, by weight or by uh, volume in terms of teaspoons. I'm throwing in a teaspoon, which is about five grams. And likewise, I'm putting in some baking powder, or ex excuse me, baking soda. which is another four or five grams. So I basically put all of my dry ingredients uh, into, the, into that <clears throat> mixing bowl. And I'm just gonna stir things up so they're evenly distributed. Um, this is really just like making a muffins or uh, very similar. It's, we're really gonna be creating, rather than a dough, we're gonna be creating a, a very th a thick batter. Um, so then we have our wet ingredients and we have buttermilk. Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of using local ingredients whenever you can. So I'll give a shout out to uh, Kate's Creamery for their, they have great buttermilk. Um, and we're putting in 227 grams of that. And then with molasses, the other wet ingredient here, there are, you'll, you can find many different types of molasses on the supermarket shelf. So um, <clears throat> these are two brands, um, Grandma's and Crosby's. Um, pretty much every type of molasses you're likely to find is going to be an unsulfured molasses. The difference between sulfur and unsulfur is when they're making the molasses, molasses is basically a byproduct of the sugar making process. So when they're using unripe sugar cane, they treat it with, <clears throat> they treat it with sulfur to preserve it. Um, and, uh, but I, I can't say that I've seen a sulfur molasses in the marketplace. I think it's probably used more for large commercial products. Uh, what you will see are different grades in terms of light, dark, and black strap. And my preference is to use either a light or a dark um, because you, you still want to taste the flavor of the grains in the bread. And the black strap, so <clears throat> they'll, they'll uh, boil up the, either the cane sugar or the beet sugar. And when it starts to crystallize, they'll remove some of those crystals. And what's left behind is uh, molasses. So on that first cut, they, you've got light molasses. If they boil it again and take out more, more of the crystalline sugar, then you have dark molasses. And then if you do it one more time, uh, you end up with blackstrap molasses. It's, it has a very, very strong flavor. And in the right application, it's wonderful. It's got kind of a smoky flavor. Um, it's not as sweet as the other two. Um, but for this type of bread, I don't really recommend the black strap. I would either go with the light or the, or the um, uh, dark. So we are going to uh, put in 160 grams of that, and I'll, I'll try the Crosby's here.
Okay, and I am going to uh, just stir that up. So again, it's the molasses is pretty thick, so you want to just make sure that those two ingredients are um, <clears throat> well mixed. And um, now we're working with a, a chemical leavener, the, the baking soda, so that reacts to acid. And the molasses has acid in it, and of course the buttermilk has lactic acid in it as well. Um, so before I add my wet ingredients to my dry, I'm going to uh, 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 grease up my containers. And in this case, uh, traditionally brown bread has been made in tin cans. Now I don't. These days, it's hard to know what your tin cans are coated with, and sometimes they're coated with uh, BPA, which <clears throat> Uh, is not necessarily a great thing to have. So I recommend either using a glass, uh, a, uh, a glass canning jar with no shoulder so that the, the bread comes out easily, or using a pudding mold like this one here, which I know they have here at the store. Um, or this is one I found uh, <clears throat> when I was just out, you know, antique shopping and, and was able to grab that one. Um, so pudding molds work well as do uh, the glass jars. And in fact, the, uh, the pumpkin uh, steam bread, which is here in front of me, was done in, in the glass jar. So we're gonna grease those up. I've melted some butter. And <clears throat> you, wanna, you wanna make sure there's a nice, a nice coating of uh, whatever, you know, usually it's, it's butter. And this is a deep, container so you really do have to use a brush um, or something to get down to the bottom of the container so we're going to do that and um, I also uh, the seam bread is going to come right up to the top so I also grease the inside of the lid And I'm, I'm going to use the uh, <clears throat> glass jar for the pumpkin bread, and I'm going to use this pudding mold for the, for the brown bread. You want to make sure you get the spindle in the center of the pudding mold. So, and I'm sorry to say, all this butter is going to go right into the bread, and it does add to the flavor profile a little bit. So, I tend to be generous with it. Okay. So, I've got my pudding mold all ready. Uh, <clears throat> I've got my dry ingredients here. I'm just going to dump in my wet. And I, I'm just going to stir that up. Um, again, it's not like regular bread where you're developing gluten. We're not doing that. So um, it's just incorporating the ingredients <clears throat> so there are no lumps. Um, and you can see that's kind of a gloopy, a gloopy batter. Um, and you would think, oh, I don't know if that's really going to make bread, something like we have in front of us over there, but it, it does. So I'm going to sp just spoon that right into the container, to the pudding mold. So this, is, this recipe is designed for this particular mold, which is a one and a half uh, quart mold. But if you have a smaller mold or a bigger one, the nice thing about working with grams is you can easily uh, increase or decrease that, that formula 
just by using a little multiplication or, or division. So <clears throat> this is what it looks like. We're about two thirds of the way up the mold and this is gonna rise quite a bit. So you really don't wanna overfill it because it's likely to push the lid right off the top. So two thirds, <coughs> at the very most three quarters is what you really need to do. And so I'm gonna pass those dirty dishes over there. We'll need those again shortly. And I'm gonna put my top on and I have a, uh, a pot of boiling water here and I just need a light simmer so I'm going to turn this down and uh, I have a little trivet at the bottom so you don't want the the bottom of your either your glass container or your pudding mold to uh, be sitting right on the the heat from the bottom of the pot so it's going to sit on that trivet I'm going to put that in there and uh, Louisa, if you could grab me a ladle and the, the um, uh, I'm going to take a little bit. I've got a little bit too much water in here. My, my pudding mold is floating. Um, that's great. Thank you. And if you could dump that and bring that back. So you want the water, uh, the simmering water to be about two thirds to three quarters of the way up the container. It's important that the lid of the container be tight. Um, and you, if you put too much water in, you're likely to have some of that boiling water splash <clears throat> into the, on top of the, the steam bread. And you're gonna end up with a gloopy kind of mess to it, um, which believe me, I have done more than once before. So. We get to learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes and it makes you a better baker. Okay, I think we're good there. So I've got a light simmer going um, so I'm gonna just pop the lid on that <clears throat> and let's while we're over here at the stove let's just look at our other containers here so here is uh, uh, the pudding uh, mold with the um, uh, pumpkin bread in it or actually yeah I think that's pumpkin bread in this one and I'm gonna to top this up. I'll actually, I'll take, take some water. About halfway through, so these, these breads steam for about an hour and a half. Usually about halfway through. Um, even with a cover, some of the steam's gonna get out. So you, you need to just kind of top it off and uh, bring it back up a little bit. Um, and <clears throat> uh, but other than that, they're pretty no fuss. You don't have to turn them. You don't have to um, uh, be peeking in on in on them all the time. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So if we have those bowls, oh, there we are, right here. If we could just give those a quick rinse, that would be great. Uh, all right, so for the next recipe, when we think of brown breads, where people almost exclusively think of the, uh, or steam breads, they think exclusively of the brown bread. Um, but the reality is, is this format you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, and uh, pumpkin bread is one thing I've, I've always enjoyed. Now, depending on the time of year, you're not gonna find fresh uh, cooking pumpkins in the stores, but any kind of squash will work. Um, 
It could be acorn squash or butternut squash. Um, uh, pretty much they, they all work. So let's uh, work through this recipe here. So this uses buckwheat flour. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, not the same kind of buckwheat that's grown up in uh, Rustic County, uh, up in the uh, St. John River Valley for ploys. Um, it's a, uh, st a type of buckwheat that's grown in, in Japan and, and other places it's used for soba noodles. Um, it has a very dark color to it, almost a gray cast. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with 60 grams of that. Um, and actually, I say it's not being grown up in, in Maine or up in Arista County, but it actually is because Aurora Mills grows this type of buckwheat for a Japanese restaurant in um, Portland that makes their own soba noodles. But uh, it's not available to, to the public, I believe. So You can find uh, this type of buckwheat flour at, at most of your co-ops and uh, actually I think even in Hannaford's, it's uh, Bob's Red Mill uh, produces it. <clears throat> so we've got 60 grams of that. We have corn flour, which is different than cornmeal. Uh, again, this is produced by Bob's Red Mill. Um, the corn is ground into a flour as opposed to a meal. Um, And we're looking at 60 grams of corn flour. And uh, uh, the Flint cornmeal again, 80 grams. baking powder, and salt. So, <clears throat> in terms of how you season this bread, uh, you have lots of options. Uh, I'm using cardamom in this particular recipe, and uh, Griffin Ridge, which is a local spice company, I know they carry the uh, their products here in the store is just <clears throat> their their spices are incredibly uh, aromatic fresh really high quality and uh, cardamom is one of my favorite spices so I'm gonna put cardamom in here that's the way I've written up the recipe but you can add all sorts if you're a fan of uh, pumpkin pie spices you know allspice cinnamon nutmeg you can throw those in uh, if you want to go with something that's a little funkier and more savory, you can throw coriander and cumin in. Uh, it's really just whatever your imagination, wherever your imagination brings you, you can, you can put in there. So this cardamom is very strong flavored, so I'm only going to be using about three grams of it, which is about a teaspoon. Okay, so that is all of my <clears throat> dry ingredients. So I'm gonna just mix those up. Oh, would you mind grabbing the, I, I forgot, uh, maple syrup. I know there's some in the refrigerator there. Fabulous, thank you. So, um, so with this, we have uh, three wet ingredients. We have the pureed uh, squash, which I cooked up at home. Uh, and depending on the type of squash, some squashes are very dry. You may find that um, you have to add a little bit of water to, to the, the uh, squash just to loosen it up a little bit. Some others are wetter, and it may just take a little bit of uh, trial and error to come up with, with the right moisture content. Um, so we are going to zero that out and um, so 150 grams. And 
and there we go 150 grams so we've got squash then we throw in uh, buttermilk at 175 and also shake up the buttermilk because it does tend to separate And then we uh, move on to the last one, the maple syrup at 150 grams. Okay. And then again, we do the same thing. We just make stir everything together, make sure it's well distributed. And I'm gonna pour that right on top. Okay, so as I said, you learn by your mistakes and I have just made a mistake because this, <clears throat> if you look at this batter, um, it's pretty gloopy, gloopier than the last one. So I'm gonna have to adjust this formula and I can do it on the fly. You can even do this at home um, and I'll make sure I, I fix it so the store has the correct uh, formula in here. But I'm just gonna throw in a little bit more of the, uh, the buckwheat flour and the, the corn flour, um, just to stiffen that up a little bit. So I'm throwing in 25 grams of the corn flour. Let's see what that, oh, actually, yeah, this is, it, um, it's a little deceptive. Um, when you first mix these up, they, um, they tend to, uh, they'll be loose, but as those grains in there hydrate, it'll stiffen up. Um, so it may be that, <clears throat> I think this still would have needed just a little bit more flour in there but um, that's that's all we need to add is that extra 25 grams so we're going to throw this in the um, into the jar and again you really only want to fill this jar two-thirds to three-quarters of the way up And the nice thing about doing it in a jar is that you really, you, while it's steaming, you can actually see how much it moves uh, up because of the uh, leavening from the baking soda. So I'm gonna go about there, throw my lid on. And let's see, we are headed over here. 
I'm going to just pop that in with the other one. And you can see the bread that's almost ready to be pulled out compared to the one that I just put in there. So I'm going to cover that back up and I can I give it just a little more heat. So if you're working with a, a gas range, <clears throat> it's easy to adjust it so you've got a nice slow simmer going or if you're working with an induction stove it's easy to do it if you're working with an election electric range where it the elements come on get to a certain temp go off come back on go off you may find it's a little bit harder to regulate um, a, a nice slow simmer but i'm you know just try the best you can <clears throat> and um and you know you'll be you'll be fine all right so I think we're all set with that. Thank you. Um, and all set with that. Um, okay, so let's just take a look at the time. 35. So we've got about um, oh five to ten minutes before we're ready to pull the uh, the breads that are steaming that I put in earlier. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. Um, I, can I talk about your book for a sec? Absolutely, so yes. So one of the things that I love about your book is the recipes all have grams, ounces, and volume. Um, so it's a great way to get used to how, um, like how much a gram is. A gram is a teaspoon of something or a half teaspoon of something else. Um, and it's great for using the scales that we sell here at the store because they all can be teared to zero and they all have um, different units. So you can do grams or pounds and ounces um, and that is really handy. Is, and I also wanted to mention my favorite <laughs> spatula, which you saw Jim using great for stirring, great for scooping stuff out. Yep. Beautiful spoonula. The lovely array of OXO pop top containers, which keep your ingredients dry and keep the um, moths out. Is there a um, brown bread recipe in here? There is actually. There are three nice. different steamed bread recipes in awesome. there. Awesome. Yep. And you have um, <clears throat> another recipe that I love that's in this book is the one that has the seaweed in it. Oh, the yes. Dal yep. Dal Sourdough with, with dulcet. Yeah. Yep. Which is a really yep. great recipe, also. Yep. Um, and my last question for you is how do you know that your bread is done? Is it all by time or is there a... Uh, uh, so the bread should reach a temperature of 205 degrees. Um, and when you, it's, oh, it's just like testing really a cake. Uh, you put a, a toothpick or something in there and a skewer. And if it, if it comes out cleanly, then it's, it's baked or steamed. And if it, it doesn't if you've still got stuff sticking to it then you, it needs more time hour and a half is pretty much what you're what you're looking for um uh the breads are very very moist so they do need that long cooking time this is not a bread that you can just rush and say okay i'm just going to do it for an hour instead of an hour and a half you really do need to take the time with it and when you take it out does it have to it for a while in its container or do you take it right out immediately uh what i do is i take it out and i um uh there's a lot of moisture there so if you tend to leave it in the container they can get a little bit soggy around the outside so i like to take it right out uh just invert the containers on a uh a cooling rack which we'll actually have to grab one of those here um, um and <clears throat> And then uh, just let the, the bread kind of slip out of the, the container it's in, whether it's a pudding mold or um, a, uh, uh, a, a jar. And these breads work well. You can eat them right out of the, the uh, right from the steam bath. Um, they're warm, great with a little butter. Um, if you're serving it with like an, a meal, a Thanksgiving dinner, or whatever it might be, you can throw them right on the table. Um, or you can let them cool, and then they toast beautifully. I mean, they're just, it's a great breakfast bread. Um, 
and toast up and then throw whatever you want on it. Hummus, uh, uh, butter, I don't really need to throw any sweeteners on there um, because it, they're pretty sweet as it is. Um, so uh, lots of versatility there in terms of what you can do with them. So I think we're ready to take a look at these. Um, so we're going to grab I think I got it. There we go. And this one's already growing. Yeah, that's one is already not quite all the way up, but it's getting close. Yep. And actually, I think we could throw a little more water in there. Okay. I'll take care of that for you. So you can see that um, <clears throat> this one didn't come quite all the way up, but close. And I'm just going to, it looks like, oh my God, that's never going to come out, but I'm just going to invert that and just let it sit for a few minutes. And you can see it's already sliding out there. Um, Let gravity do its work. And voila. And I wish we could get the aroma of that onto Facebook Live because that is a wonderful, wonderful smell. Okay. So you do want to be careful when you're handling all of this stuff because <clears throat> there's a lot of steam coming off the pots. There's a lot of really hot, almost boiling water. Uh, so you, you do need to be careful um, uh, so you don't burn yourself or uh, get a, a, a steam burn. So here's what it looks like uh, before I pop it out. And you can see the difference in color between the brown bread and the pumpkin bread, which has the... Uh, uh, no molasses, but has uh, maple syrup in it. And we are just going to pop that right over. Voila. Wow. And you can see, whether it be uh, the pudding mold I used uh, for the brown bread that's in the pot now, or this, this type of mold. I mean, it, it's a simple, but very, very nice presentation in terms of what it what it looks like. Um, the advantage to the jars, you get a nice even, uh, you know, slices that are all the same size. Uh, nobody's gonna fight over the small slice or the big size slice because they're all the same. Whereas with, you know, something coming out of a pudding, th at least this pudding mold, they might, might fight over it because it's so darn tasty. Um, uh, but, you know, again, this is so simple that it, I'm surprised that people don't work with these breads more often because they are very, very easy to make. 